the stone was rolled away. The angel said, fear not, for he has arisen from the dead. Death could not contain him. He lives just like he said.
Pharisees called him a devil cause they brushed their doctrines aside. And soldiers called him the king of the Jews and they mocked him as he hung and died. Pilate called him an innocent man, tried to wash blood off his hands. But the crowd called aloud that day, say you crucify that man. But I called him father, father, friend, friend. the beginning and the end. I called him a constant, constant. a companion. He's been there through a thick and thin. I called him in the rain, nobody. When it's just me and me. Welcome to South Ashboro Church of God. Good to see those of you in God's house. Thankful for those watching online. It's good to be here. Good to be in his presence. Let's all stand together and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's remember those uh, that are going through different situations this morning. Let's continue to remember my mother-in-law. Let's remember Sister Tina and her family, what they're facing now. God's a big God and can help each and every one of us. Them watching online, those that are going through these battles and trials. But let's call on him together. Ask for his help in every situation and in this service today. Precious Heavenly Father. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy receive our penny march and then come back around to receive our Sunday school offering. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all
great things today. Uh, teachers, you can take charge of your classes. Those of you that are in the adult class, <coughs> we are on lesson number eight. You can turn with us to Joshua 14 and your uh, quarterly that you have. I love the Lord, don't you? Amen. Love him. He's so faithful to us. Mountaintop, valley, wherever we're at, somewhere in between, God is faithful. I'm looking for him to do, again, great things today. Covet your prayers as we go through this lesson today. Lesson 8, called the courage of Caleb. I would like to call it possessing a different spirit. Um, keeping with, the, of course, the theme uh, of, the, of the lesson. But I want to review real quickly the last several weeks. I think it's important to kind of review to keep us in a perspective of where we are in the story of the Israelites with the children of Israel. We know have crossed the Jordan. They began to conquer Canaan, one city at a time, Jericho first. Ai was second. Remember, they're sitting in the camp, so they, they battle with Ai two times. The sin of the camp was dealt with, of course. And then last week we, discuss, we discussed the trickery, trickery of the Gibeonites and the league they made with the Israelites through deception. Y'all remember that story. We learned about being guarded against the wiles of the devil by putting on the whole armor of God and being filled, being full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Much takes place between Joshua 9, which is where we were last week in Lesson 7. Much takes place between there and here where we are today in Joshua 14. So let me just read a section, uh, a little introduction to kind of brief you on what happened in those chapters. Chapters 10, 11, and 12 detail the kings and, and cities which Israel conquered in rapid succession. In chapter 13, Joshua begins the task of dividing the land among the tribes of Israel for their inheritance. Our lesson today comes from chapter 14 where we meet again a very courageous man by the name of Caleb. You will remember that Caleb and Joshua were the only two spies to give a good report at Kadesh Barnea. Caleb was one of the two older men that entered the promised land. The rest died in the wilderness. Um, our objective in today's lesson, in my own words, is to see in the life of Caleb a pattern, a consistency of faith that each of us should strive to possess ourselves. We can be like Caleb, amen, and have a different spirit. The golden text comes from, actually comes from Judges, chapter 1, verse 20. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Now let's read our scriptures together. Joshua 14, 6 through 13, there in your quarterly. Let's read this and get started. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee, in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He's eighty-five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. I absolutely love reading that scripture. It just does something in my spirit, I'm telling you. <laughs> now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, <clears throat> and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Just a word about that. Right before this, this is where they're casting lots in those days. They use those lots to decide a lot of things, but they're casting lots to decide who is going to be where. And before those lots ever get cast, Caleb steps up and says, wait a minute. 
God promised me something, and he's going to give it to me. I, I admire his, his determination and that promise that was given to him, and that's exactly what was given to him on that day. I'm amazed at Caleb. In order, order to truly know this man, Caleb, we must travel back to his first introduction into scriptures found in Numbers 13. You can turn there with me. It is there that 12 spies are chosen to go in and view the promised land. Numbers 13. Turn back to that. I'm just going to be reading the first four verses and part of verse 6. Part of verse 4 and part of verse 6. But And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is back in the day. Now they're all together, fixing to go in wanting to go into Canaan. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. So this isn't just a fly by night. I need a good man out of each tribe, and each tribe is going to be represented as we go into this searching out of the land. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel, and the, verse 4 says, and these were their names. And they start listing them off. Verse 6 tells us of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Let me read you this from these notes here. Caleb was, again, one of the spies that were sent into Canaan to view the land. It is important to remember that they were not sent in to decide whether or not Israel should enter the land. That was not theirs to decide. That wasn't even, God had already declared that they were going to enter the land. The, the spies were just on an information-gathering excursion. They were to map the land, see where the cities were and how they were defended, locate the rivers, the streams, etc. But when they returned, ten of them began to give an evil report of the land. They discouraged the whole nation of Israel and caused them to doubt God and his promises. But we know that while ten saw the land as full of giants, Two men saw it as the land that was promised to them, a land that God had told them to go in and possess. And we know those two men to be Joshua and Caleb. Now at this point in our lessons in the quarterlies that we've done for several weeks now, we know a lot about Joshua. We've talked a lot about him. He was the successor of Moses, and he has been the subject or the main character in our last several lessons. But today, let's learn about and focus on the other spy, Caleb. The first thing we must know, must build part of our lesson on is what God himself had to say about Caleb. As God is sentencing all those who were 20 and above to die in the wilderness because of their unbelief in Numbers 14, and as he is in the midst of speaking of their judgment and punishment, he stops to speak specifically of Caleb. Look in for, uh, Numbers 14, you're already there. Look at verse 24. He's sentencing them. He's telling them that you're not going to go in. You've, you've disobeyed me. You've, you've been doubtful of me, and you're not going to go in. But he stops. This is God speaking. This is amazing to me, and it's so wonderful that God stops and speaks of one man. Verse 24 says, but my servant Caleb. Don't you want God to call you that? God stops and says, look, all of y'all, you've, you've disobeyed me. This is your sentence. But my servant Caleb. Because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Let's just stop and say here that in the midst of God's sentencing of this wicked world, which he is doing and will continue to do more of as the day approaches, when he goes to pour out his wrath and punishment on all those who rebel against him, and refuse to give their hearts and lives to him, I want him to stop and speak of me as his servant. Don't you feel the same way? When all the, he is, he is pouring out judgment. I fully believe that. And there's more to come, but I want to be that one that he stops and says, but Amy, she's my servant. I, that's the kind of life I want to live, don't you? I believe that you do. I want to have that kind of spirit. I want him to stop and recognize me as one of his as one who follows him fully, I want to be known like Caleb to God first and to the rest of this world as someone who is his servant and someone who has another spirit. Much like Job was spoken of by God to the devil in Job, 10, Job 1 and 8, 
when he said, have you considered my servant Job? This is my servant Caleb moment here for Caleb. Another, the word another in its original Hebrew form simply means different. You know, possessing a different spirit. Different by definition. We know what it means, but I like to look up definitions. Not the same as another. It's distinct. It is separate. Amen? Different spirit. Caleb was different. He had a different spirit about him, and the first sign of that is found in Numbers 13, verse 30. If you're still there, you can go back to verse to chapter 13, verse 30. When the majority of the spies who returned began spreading their doubts and their fears about going in to possess the land, when they began sharing how big and strong the inhabitants of the land were, Caleb interrupted them. He interrupted them all and said this in Numbers 13 and 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. He's like, just hush. Hush be still. And said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are all we are well able to overcome it. Amen? Let me read you some of this from these notes. Caleb said that, excuse me, God said that Caleb had another spirit. He had a spirit different than that manifested by the ten cowardly spies. If we will be men and women of God, we must have another spirit than that which is evident in our world today. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27 says, For I will take you from among the heathen, heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Praise God, he has cleansed us from all the idols of this world. A new heart also will I give you. Amen. And a new spirit, praise the Lord, will I put, upon, put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen. Thank the Lord. In spite of the earnest appeal of Joshua and Caleb, we know that the people, I need 12 desks up here, believe the evil report and refuse to enter into Canaan, Canaan to inhabit it. In Numbers 14 and 24, God said that Caleb had another spirit. In other words, Caleb had a different spirit than the ten spies who gave the evil report. What kind of spirit did those ten spies have? Well, the writer of the quarterly has several things that I'm just going to read off, and I, I assume it's in your quarterly as well. Again, I don't know exactly what yours looks like. But the first thing he said of the, of the ten spies that had the negative report, they had a pessimistic spirit. They suppressed the good news and emphasized the bad news. They looked past the abundance of the land and saw only the obstacles that were, that were there. They were not as impressed with the fruit of the land as they were with the walled cities, the strong armies, and the giants. Some of us today are just like these spies. spies excuse me, we are so sensitive to the bad and blind to the good. To hear some Christians tell it, Everyone is backslidden, yeah, and carnal except themselves, of course. They are consumed with a pessimistic spirit. We all realize that there is great evil in our world, but we must also admit that God has not changed, and he is still in control. Amen? Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw the mud, the ground. The other saw the stars in the sky. It's amazing how some people, you know, we can all come to the same, same service, and get two totally different things out of it. It depends on what we put in, truly. If you want something from the Lord, he's going to give it to you. If you come into the house of the Lord that's consecrated, then the Holy Ghost is here, which I believe, and thankful that this house is that. You come in with the right spirit, you're going to leave touched and blessed and encouraged and ready to fight another day. But if you come in with a pessimistic spirit that things are bad and woe is me and nobody cares and all of this kind of stuff we've all been there then you're going to leave the same way unless the lord intervenes praise god <laughs> hope he does today these these 10 spies had a pessimistic spirit they had a cowardly spirit uh, you know they said we will not be able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we they completely forgot what god said this is your land you're just going in here to tell, find out where the streams are where their walls are, we're just, we're, we're spying out the land. 
not to decide whether we're going in. But they turned it again on themselves and they turned it again to their decision that they could decide, well, we're not going to take this land because it just looks too hard. These ten spies admitted they were cowards. They had never seen the people of Canaan in actual battle, so they didn't really know if they were strong or not. They only knew that they were afraid to face the battle regardless of who the foe might be. The coward never experiences victory because he never experiences battle. If we run from the devil, run from Satan, the world, and the flesh, we will be overcome. We must stand up against evil, fight the good fight of faith. Amen. They also had an unbelieving spirit. They said, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up from the inhabitants thereof. But what about the words of God before they ever searched the land? He had already promised in Numbers 13 and 2 that he was going to give the land of Canaan to Israel as their inheritance. Do not the promises of God count for something? Oh, yes, they do. Sometimes that's all we have to go on. Sometimes that's all I have. I don't have an answer per se. I don't have a literal, I can feel it, touch it, see it answer, but a promise is what I have. That's my answer. And that's all you need. If a promise from God is what you have, then hold on to that. It is so real, just as real as what you look at. It's real in the spirit. Uh, They also had a discouraging spirit. The spies wanted the people to be as discouraged as they were, so they resorted to exaggeration. Have you ever heard anybody exaggerate how bad it is in this life and how bad the devil's fighting them? I'm not saying that he doesn't, but sometimes we can get in our own way and we can get in our own mess and think that it's just too big for God. These spies wanted the people to be as discouraged as they were. They said we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Remember that statement? This was not a true representation. It was considerably overdone, amen? The reason they talked like this was to create a mental picture in the minds of the people that would cause discouragement. It really worked for them too, right? Isn't it amazing how that one discouraged saint will go to great lengths to discourage another so that he will have company? I don't want to do that. Do you? They had a complaint. They had a a pessimistic spirit, cowardly spirit, unbelieving spirit, discouraging spirit. They had a complaining spirit. We know that. The spies of the congregation of Israel began to weep and sob. They continued crying all night long. Then they began to murmur against Moses, Aaron, and God. If we would spend more time being thankful, we would waste less time complaining and crying. We've all been there. I've been there where I thought it was just too hard to overcome, and I got consumed in myself, and I had to really quickly. If you're spirit-filled, the Holy Ghost help you with that. Nudge you a little bit and say, wait a minute get up we don't we don't live like this we live by faith we live by the presence of the power of god and we live spirit-minded they had a rebellious spirit of course and they said let us make a captain let us return unto egypt these spies led the people in rebellion against god's appointed leaders they felt that they could do whatever they wanted to do whether whether it was what god wanted or not we know where it got them Many years of wandering in the wilderness. Rebellion does not produce anything good in anybody's life. They had a murderous spirit. The mob began shouting for Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb to be stoned. They were ready to murder these godly men and would have if God had not intervened. What a shame. But that's the way people that don't live close to the Lord, that want to live against him, they're going to come against those. It's just it's just all throughout the Bible. Here it is again. Those that don't want to serve the Lord, those that are rebelling against him, they're going to pull against and not like those that want to serve the Lord. Let me get back to my notes. It is easy to see the different spirit that Caleb had is evident in his statement made on the day when the spies first returned with their evil report, which we read there in Numbers 13. And it is just as evident in our scriptures we read today. Caleb's the same man. He, he told them in, in Numbers 13, he told them, let's go in and take this land. And here we have him 45 years later. We're reading these scripture texts that are in our quarterly where he's saying, I'm the same man that served God then. I was on fire for him then, and this is my moment. Give me this mountain. I have waited all these years. What a great testimony. What an awesome man of God. Here we have in Caleb, we find him, a much older man. He's been witness to a lot of things. 
during the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And he has had to suffer a great deal during this time because of other people's choices. Bad choices hurt good people. It's a plain and simple reality, but the bad choices made by others, though it hurts our surroundings, and it does, like that of Caleb. Now, Caleb didn't want to sleep in the wilderness for 40 years. Caleb didn't want to attend funerals multiple times a day. He didn't want to waste his good years walking around in circles. But it didn't have to, and it didn't affect his spirit. Amen? Though the surroundings of, of, of our own day are affected and, and continually infected by those who don't love the Lord, be it in your own family or just in the workplace, wherever it is, those things affect your surroundings, but they do not have to and cannot affect or infect your spirit. What great opportunity Caleb had to get sour in his spirit year after year, wandering when he was the one that said, let's go in and take this land. What ample time he had to get lost in misery and self-pity, but he didn't. This is one of the main signs of being different. Caleb had a different spirit. His spirit was full of faith and full of courage despite all the negativity around him. There's a lot to be said for someone who can live amongst so much unbelief and doubt yet still shout the victory. Amen? You and I must possess a different spirit. No matter our surroundings or, our bad, or the bad choices those have made around us, we must continue to know how to possess our vessels. Luke 21 and 19, 19 says, in your patience, possess ye your souls. First Thessalonians 4 and 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, possessing and holding on to what you have with God despite what everything is going on around you. We must be on our guard to not let the attitudes and the spirits of this age work their way into our lives. To be different doesn't just mean to be visibly different it doesn't just mean to look different amen although that has merit and shouldn't be ignored or shunned there's power in a separated outward appearance provided there is first a separated spirit that goes along with it amen i'm gonna say that again there's power in a separated outward appearance provided there is first a separated spirit that goes along with it. I've seen some really nasty spirits masquerading around in sanctified bodies. From my own personal experience, experience, I can testify of God's sanctifying work that cleansed me from the inside out. No doubt about it. I did cast off things in my wardrobe and things that I put on like the world, but I did those things as God opened my eyes to be consecrated to him in my spirit man. Romans 12 and 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the re renewing of your mind, not just your, your mind here, but your mind, your, your soul, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can't stop with verse 1. Verse 2 is so much important. It's, it's just as important as verse 1. Body and spirit, mind. Caleb had to have a want to, right? A made up mind in order to stay strong all those years. How is your state? How's the state of your want to? How is it today? In what condition is your will and your determination to fight the good fight of faith? What strength do you have left after all the years or all the months or all the days, depending on where you are in the Lord? What kind of strength do you have left? It must be like Caleb's. It must be just as strong as it has ever been, or you won't make it, I won't make it. We've got to be determined. Two minutes. I'm going to count it. Well, really, I don't. Let me just, let me just throw this in here. I have a lot more to say, but. One important thing about Caleb, he was able to stand, just like the Bible says in Ephesians 6, we talked about the whole armor last week. When it, 
when you have done all to stand, the next word is stand, right? When having done all to stand, you stand. That's, that's, that's the testimony of Caleb. That's the kind of testimony I have. I don't want to just hang around with people that are like Caleb. I want to be like Caleb. Amen? I want to surround myself with Caleb's, but I want to be him too. Amen? I love what Caleb had, and I'm glad that that kind of spirit was not just exclusive to him. Amen? It can be ours as well because it's the same God who gives that kind of spirit. Let me just mention this real quickly, that Caleb's, uh, his children, that was what blessed me so much. Um, let me just read this real quick. We have enumerated the blessings. Uh, Caleb was blessed in many ways at receiving uh, when, he got, when he got his mountain, when he got his area because of his commitment to the Lord. But it is noteworthy that he was blessed to see his own children also receiving their inheritance in the land. You know, if you go back and read, and I encourage you to do that if you hadn't already, um, he lived to see his children receive their inheritance in the land. His daughter, Aksa, had the same spirit that her father had, and she came asking for her, her inheritance in Joshua 15. She asked for the land. She'd been given some. Thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the, the lower springs, the nether springs. He had children that had the same kind of spirit. Listen, I want to have a good spirit because I want to make it to heaven. But I want to have a good spirit because I want the children that are coming up behind me, not just my own flesh and blood, but your children, to come up behind me and have the same spirit, and they can. Joshua, I mean, Caleb's life is proof of that. He lived in such a way, and he empowered those that were coming up behind him to go after the promises of God just as he did. I love this story. I hope you got something out of it. There's more to say, but we'll stop here. Praise the Lord. Let's have church together. I love him, don't you? Let's go to heaven together. Praise the Lord.
welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. So good to see you in God's house today. Uh, you know, we're so uh, glad that you're watching online. Uh, if you can't be here, at least watch online. But I hope everybody will be here if you can. Let's stand and open up the service in prayer this morning. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord God, for this opportunity to be back here with us again today. I thank you for each and every one of you. Thank all the youth that came out yesterday. We had a wonderful service yesterday, and if uh, you, the youth missed it, they missed a uh, good time. We had a wonderful time. We started at three, and I think the last one's left at seven. So, and we still didn't get everything done, but we had a wonderful time. We've got a wonderful group of, of youth. We're proud of them. Uh, we went out, and they behaved themselves well. Praise God. I uh, appreciate our youth. Uh, for our Sunday school, we had a wonderful Sunday school lesson this morning. Uh, and, uh, Sister Amy said, if we will, let's be studying uh, lesson number nine for next week. And if the Lord directs us, that's where we'll go for the next week, lesson number nine. Uh, you know, let's uh, go ahead and continue ministering as we get our uh, choir to come at this time and ministering song. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
whatever we're going Thank through you, may be things may be hard right now, but after a while it'll all be over. Be Praise Lord. God. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to speak on just a couple of minutes. It says, we're all fruit bearers. What kind of fruit are we bearing? You know, uh, Matthew 7, 16 said, you shall know them by their fruits. Romans 6, 22 said, but now being made free from sin, it don't say free in sin, it's free from sin, and become service to God, you have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Our fruits are unto holiness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's continue to worship and give, and we'll get our ushers come receive our tithe and offering. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus. Brother Eddie, would you pray with this time of worship? As far as announcements, uh, the 18th, or February 18th, that'll be next Saturday night, or this coming Saturday night, will be the Valentine Banquet at uh, 5 p.m. And then on the following uh, Saturday, we'll have our uh, Bible study uh, on uh, at 2 o'clock. Also, uh, had a birthday, a birthday this week. Uh, uh, Odell, he got a year older. So let's stand and sing happy birthday to Odell. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you, amen. Do you have any uh, anniversaries since last Sunday? Okay. All right. Uh, got a lot to pray about today. Uh, let's continue praying for Brother and Sister Balls healing. Uh, We'll see him sitting back over here. Pray for Sister Sanders' complete healing. We'll see her sitting back over here. God is able. God's not changed. Praise God. Let's pray for Sister Tina and family. Her dad's in the hospice house now. Let's pray for them. Uh, they need our prayers. Pray for. Uh, continue praying for Sister Key, Brother Short Ridge, and Brother Speed's healing. Uh, pray for revival. Lord, revive us again. We need a revival. I know we've got a scheduled revival coming next month, but we don't have to wait till next month. We can be in revival now. Let's uh, pray, continue praying for uh, Sister Sarah Stillman. God will touch her and her body. I know she had bronchitis, so we pray for her. Uh, pray for uh, Jimmy Barnes. Uh, I know he come with Brother and Sister Albright before. He had a heart attack, and he's in Pinehurst Hospital. So pray for Jimmy Barnes. Uh, pray for Sister Albright. She's been having some back trouble. Uh, pray for Clifford. Uh, Reading for healing. Pray for Donna. She's sick today, sick in her body. Pray for uh, Brother uh, Dean's job situation. Pray for your Sister Anna's job situation. Also pray for Cora York. This is Brother Scott's uh, grandmother. She had a gallbladder removed, and she needs a touch in her body. Also pray for Sister Anna's friend, Shannon. She's sick in her body. Does anybody else have a prayer request today? Yes, remember Brother Patrick. God will touch him in his body. Yes, let's pray for Sister Judy's daughter, Teresa. Yes. Pray for Brother Zach. Yeah. Um, Uncle Monty, he had a heart attack. 
Yes, yeah, pray for Brother Zach, Uncle Monty, who had a heart attack, so pray that God will touch him and heal him. Yes, Tracy. Okay, pray for Mason, who's got COVID, and for Noah, Nova and Liam. I don't know what they're sick, but uh, just God will touch them. All right. That's a good sign. Praise God. For this prayer support, Dwayne's better. <laughs> yes, sir, Saints. Yes, pray for Sister Valerie. Uh, got bronchitis and sinus infection. Pray for Sister Anne's also. Yes, pray for Haley. She's sick in her body. Yes, Pray for Brother Oliver's granddaughter, Chloe. Yes, pray for Amy and Michaela's uh, mother and daughter. The day God will touch him in a mighty way. He's able. And uh, that the sister Sarah, she did have flu instead of the bronchitis, so they just misdiagnosed it. But. Praise God. Anyone else have a prayer request? Sister Mary Lee has prayed that even um, with the bronchitis and the flu, that she might see him soon. She gets really frustrated, um, you know, of being out here with the flu. But she said he had a week and half of flu. It was uh, it's odd because he has his immune system, you know, I know you and Abby Ben, you know, Mary, and your husband and wife. We sure will. We'll be praying about this. Amen. God willing, He is able. Praise God. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you. We just thank you. We praise you, Lord God, for this opportunity to today.
This time we'll turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Amen. Give God a good hand clap off and a praise this morning. Praise God. That should be the desire of every Christian. If your desire is not to be like Jesus, then you are not saved. That too straight? That's the truth. When you get Christ in your heart, that renewed work in your life, that divine, supernatural work that takes place, it's going to change everything about you. Amen. Amen. Salvation deals with the penalty of sin in your life, which is death. Sanctification deals with the power of sin in your life. So you got to go on and be sanctified and let God keep on sanctifying you. Amen. There has to be a break with the practice of sin. If you get saved and you keep practicing sin, you're not going to stay saved. Whatever that thing is, whatever those things are that hold, you try to hold on to, they're going to pull you away from church. They're going to pull you away from Christ. You may still go to church, but if you practice sin, you can't go to heaven. There has to be a break from that power of sin. And only Jesus can do that in us. I was as bound as any man on this earth in sin when I was lost. And I'm as free as any Christian when I got saved. He set me free. He broke those chains that had me bound. That's one of the great things about salvation. You get to go free. You're not bound by sin any longer. You're not in bondage any longer. Amen. I've watched it. I've been pastoring a long time now. And I've watched people who held on to sinful things. They didn't want to let things go or felt like they couldn't. And those things pulled them right back in the muck and the mire. You have to make a break with the practice of sin. A Christian does not practice a sinful lifestyle. If you do that, you need to get saved. Amen. Not preaching that this morning, but I feel good about this, don't you? Praise God. There are people who practice sin and say they're saved, but they won't go to heaven that way. You have to break from that sinful lifestyle. You get saved, you got to cut ties with that old world the way that you lived before. Now, there has to be a desire, and Christ puts that desire in you. I know there's people who get saved, and they still struggle. I understand that. They struggle with things. But God will give you the grace to leave it all behind. If you really want to serve the Lord and be free, you can. The blood of Jesus still has the power to do that. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We want to continue to pray for Sister Tina and, and Kathy and uh, Amanda, that family, all of them. Uh, Dean's at Hospice House. Now he's been there since Thursday. I'm sorry, since Friday. And uh, so keep praying for them. Uh, we talked to her again this morning, and she said he's still the same right now. And uh, they don't know when he's going to leave here, but the Lord does. We pray God will give them grace during this time. It's hard. You know if you've lost a loved one, especially if you had to watch them like that. And uh, it's a difficult thing. But God helps us in those times. Amen. So keep praying for them. God will just help them and give them strength. Pray for the lost in that family. I always pray when this, when this happens, if somebody dies uh, or dying, I always pray for the lost in that family. Let this time. Sometimes hearts get tender during those times and are pliable. And God can deal with them. So you pray for the lost in that family. They have lost in their family just like we, like everybody else does. And pray God will save them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. People to get saved out of this. Amen. Amen. And uh, pray for Dean. I talked to him the last time he was in the hospital. Run everybody out of the room. Just me and him and the Lord. And he prayed and said he had everything right with God. Then Sister Tina got to talk to him on Wednesday night, or early Thursday morning before he went into that, uh, that state he's in now. And uh, he assured her he was ready to meet the Lord. He was prepared. So that's the hope we have now. And uh, we just praise God for His goodness and His faithfulness. And uh, God's not looking to, listen, God wants to save the lost. He wants to save the lost. He's not sitting up in heaven just wanting to kill every sinner. He wants to save the sinner. And some folks get in at the very end. The thief on the cross, he got in at the last minute. And uh, so let's pray. Let's pray for that family. I know that you are, but uh, keep praying for them. I appreciate Brother Oliver. Brother Oliver, bless my heart. We were at the hospital on Thursday, and he and uh, Sister Susan worked there, and he come by that room. He'd already been by there that morning and prayed with their family. That's what a church family is for, and that's what they do. 
and he came back by when we were there and stopped by and talked. And uh, I told Sister, I just love Brother Oliver. It's just something I just love him. And uh, but he stopped in that room and prayed with that family. You'll never know what that means to a family in a time like that. Just a simple prayer, just an acknowledgement that I'm, I'm thinking about you and praying for you. And uh, I appreciate you doing that, brother. Amen. Amen. Psalms chapter 27 this morning. If you'll stand, please. I had another sermon, a message I'd worked on this week. And well, yesterday I was over here praying, studying, and God just changed the direction this morning. And I want to obey Him. Amen. I don't ever just, I don't ever start my week off getting ready to preach and just have some kind of preconceived idea of what I'm going to say. I always earnestly try to seek the Lord. And even, you know, even during the week when, when I feel like I've, I've heard from the Lord and I've prepared a, a, a message, I'm still asking Him, God, I want to make sure, I want to know that I'm going to say what you want me to say. And I want to always do that. Amen. Because there's always somebody in that congregation, whether it's one or the whole congregation, that God knows what we need. He's always faithful to us. Amen. I don't want you to come to the church and just not get nothing out of it. I want you to leave here knowing God spoke to me today. Hallelujah. God talked to me this morning. God spoke to my heart in that service. I heard from the Lord. I heard from the Word of God. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. I enjoyed the lesson this morning. Bless my heart. Psalms 27, begin reading in verse 1. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. Glad to be in the house of God today, Lord. And Lord, we've heard all these prayer requests this morning, all these needs, God. There's so many right now that have needs, God, things that are much larger than they are. They need you to move, God. We need you to intervene, Lord. And I'm glad you're an on-time God. You're a prayer-answering God. We pray over this congregation again this morning, God. I thank you for each one that's been able to come out this way today. We pray for those that are watching online today, God. You'd touch them wherever they may be, Father. I pray, God, you'd help me now for the next little while. Help me not to say any more, any less than what you want me to say. Set a guard upon my lips. Let me speak only from your word today now, Father. I pray, God, that you'll draw us and call us to the altar this morning. You'll touch lives now, Father. We just thank you. We praise you. I bind every hindrance, everything that set itself against this word today now. I pray, God, let walls fall. Let hearts be filled today. Lord, we'll leave here saying it's been so good to be in the house of God. We can leave here saying, God has touched me and God has spoken to me in my time of need. We'll love you and praise you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Praise God. Psalms 27, <clears throat> begin reading in verse 1. <clears throat> the psalmist David said, The Lord is my light, and my salvation. He's speaking personally here. He didn't say he's your light and your salvation. He said he's mine. This is out of a words from a heart that had an experience with God. Whom shall I fear? Because of my experience with God, I don't have to be afraid. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, to devour me. He's speaking in past tense, past battles. He said they stumbled and fell. Now he looks to the future. And he says, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. You know, people have a lot of different desires from God. They want this and they want that. But David said, there's one thing that I've desired. He said, that I, and that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Shut up, my mind. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in this pavilion. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, 
shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Can you give God a loud, large hand of praise this morning? Ha, ha, ha. Mama Katai. Oh, I bless it, Lord. Lift your hands up in honor the Holy Ghost that's in this house today. My blessed God. Ah, blessed God. Mm. Ah, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Hallelujah. You can be seated if you can sit down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. I want to preach to you for a little while on this thought, our blessed assurance. Our blessed assurance. In Psalms chapter 27, as we've read here in verses 1 through 5, we find from the writing of David that David shows us that he knows without a shadow of a doubt where he is with God. He knows of his experience with the Lord. He relates that fact to us that he knows uh, that he possesses God by faith. He said in verse 1 here, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I tell you, if he's your light, you'll not walk in darkness any longer. If he's your salvation, you have a blessed hope that the world knows nothing about. He is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Does it matter if you're physically weak? The Lord is the strength of your life. Paul said, when I'm weak, then I am strong. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And David said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David here, the knowledge that, that he has a walk with God, the knowledge of his relationship with the Lord, that the Lord is his light and the Lord is his salvation, it gave David much reassurance as he faced the many battles of his own personal life. And you read the life of David. David had many battles that he had to fight, many foes, many adversaries, but David had a faith in God that caused him to be reassured uh, that through the battles of life, I don't have to be afraid. The Lord is my light and the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. And then, in verse 2, he speaks, he looks back on the past victories that God has blessed him with and God had been faithful to bring him through he said, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat upon my flesh, they stumbled and failed. When he looked back in past battles, he was able to stand where he was and say, I'm here because God gave me victory in the past. Then in verse 3, David looks ahead to the future, and he speaks of all the victories that lie ahead for him by faith. He said, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. In other words, no matter what's waiting on me down the road, uh, I don't have to be afraid. The war should rise against me. Uh, in this will I be confident. David knew in his own life uh, the only safe place in the world uh, was still sheltered by God. In that place of safety, uh, amen, it had kept him in battles in days gone by. It had kept him the day that he was living then and everything in the future. Uh, David knew he would be safe uh, in the arms of God Almighty. He said in verses 4 and 5, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. 
in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. David wanted to be in a place where he could see God. David wanted to be in a place where he could speak to God. David wanted to be in a place where he could worship God. This was the all-consuming desire of the heart of David. No wonder God said, I have found me a man after mine own heart. I'm telling you, that should be the desire of every child of God today. We should desire to be in a place where we can see the hand of God. We ought to desire and seek to be in a place where we can speak to God and then God in return will speak unto us. We ought to desire to be in a place where we can worship God, where we can lift up holy hands without doubt and without wrath. We ought to desire to come before God with clean hands and with a pure heart and lift up those clean hands unto a holy God. Somebody or to say, man, this ought to be the all-consuming desire in the heart of every child of God. Raise your hands and glorify Him. Is that your desire today? Is your desire for the things of God? Is God still the love of your life? Is Jesus Christ the first thing on your mind in the morning and the last one on your mind at night? David had a desire to be near the Lord. I believe in this hour there's a waning of that desire, but we can't afford to let that love seep out. I can't afford to let my desire to be near God uh, to wane in a time like this. If the child of God has ever uh, had a desire to be near the Lord, uh, we ought to want to draw nigh unto him now. I don't want to just draw nigh for myself. Uh, I want to draw nigh for my family. I want to draw nigh for my church family. Uh, I want to draw near to God. Uh, I want you to draw near to God uh, because I know in the presence of of God is the fullness of the joy of the Lord. David said, I want to be near God. One thing have I desired. One thing have I sought after. I want to be in this house. I want to be in this temple. I want to inquire the Lord. Amen. I want to be near God Almighty. Just like David, every child of God ought to have an all-consuming desire for the Lord like never before. Amen. When that believer abides in that sheltered place, like David referred to here in verse 5, that secret place with God. Amen. We possess some blessed assurances found in the Word of God given to the children of God through the promises of our God. In these last days that we're living in, that's the kind of assurance that we need. We're all in a battle. We're fighting the battles of life. We have three adversaries, three enemies in this life. We fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm telling you, friend, if we abide in Jesus Christ, if we all have a desire to be near him, and if we'll move and position ourselves near the Lord of glory, he said, if you draw nigh to me, if I'll make the move, then God will make the move. If you draw near to me, then I will draw near unto you. If I seek after him, I'm going to find him. I want to remind you in turbulent times, in times when the fights are real and severe at times, there's still only one safe place, there's only one real hiding place, and that is in the arms, in the hands of God Almighty. We are anchored, we are sheltered safe in the arms of the Lord above. It is there that we're able to know God's very best in our lives. I don't know how you feel about it. I don't want to just live off the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Not when I've got a seat there. Not when I can sit at the table with him. He invites us, his people, to come and dine. 
We can be partakers of God's best. We can know the blessings of the Lord. I'm not talking about material things. If you want to serve God for material things, amen, you're serving him for the wrong reason. But if you serve him, you're going to know the blessings of the Lord. You're going to know peace of plenty. You're going to have joy that overflows your soul. When you go through the low valleys, he'll be there to hold your hand, to be your strength, and to see you safely through. I'm just telling you today, there is no safe place outside of Jesus Christ, but if you'll abide in him, he will abide in us, and we will come safely through. As we abide in Christ, as we walk with God, as we stay close to God, the Bible shows us there are some blessed assurances uh, that we can enjoy. First of all, David shows us here that if we abide in that place with Christ, we can have the blessed assurance of his guidance. I want to tell you, friend, we need God to guide our footsteps. I don't know what's best for me, and you don't know what's best for you. Your heart can deceive you. Your feelings can lead you the wrong way. We need God to guide us through his Holy Spirit. I'm glad that the Spirit of God will lead us and guide us in all truth. David said here in verse 5, For in the time of trouble, he, speaking of God, shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. This tells us here, this is something that God does of his own will on behalf of the believer. It is not me that puts myself in that secret place, but it's God that places me there. It is God that hides me there. It is God that sets me upon that rock. What I'm telling you is this. If you will serve the Lord, God will guide you to the right place. God will lead you to that hiding place. And when we arrive there, he's promised he will protect us. I don't know how you feel about it, but I need the protective hand of God in my life each and every day. I need him for my family. I need him for my health. I need him for my sanity. I need him for every move that I make in this life. I want the Lord to take the reins of my heart, of my life, and I want him to lead me and guide me in the right way. He's promised us he will guide us, and if you follow him, he'll lead you to that secret hiding place and protect you along the way. Lord leads us there. It is the Lord that guides our footsteps. Whenever you and I begin to try to do it on our own, follow our own path, follow the leading of others, we'll find ourselves in a mess. But if I'll follow the leading of God, if I'll let God guide me through his word, guide me through his spirit, he'll always lead me in the right way. Can you say amen? David said, in the time of trouble, he's going to hide me. He's going to take me somewhere. He's going to hide me in his pavilion. In that secret place of his tabernacle, uh, he's going to hide me there. He will set me upon a rock. That shows us that the Lord of glory, the God of all creation, that sits high on the throne, that he's still interested uh, in my life. Hey man, little old me on this earth that's just a speck of dust on this earth. God is interested in what's happening in my life and he's interested in what's happening in your life. We're not serving a God who does not know us. We're not serving a God that does not care about us. 
I told you on Wednesday night, uh, when we pray, God will move. Uh, and when he moves, uh, it gives us a reassurance uh, that he's hearing our prayers. Uh, sometimes David Daniel had to pray 21 days uh, and nothing happened. Uh, but after that 21st day, uh, God moved and God answered him. Uh, sometimes we have to pray and pray. Uh, and it seems like nothing's taking place. Uh, but if you keep on praying, uh, we have the assurance uh, God's going to show up. It's not that he don't see us. It's not that he don't hear us. But God's got a perfect timing in everything that he does. But if I wait on him, he's going to show up right on time and let me know I'm still here. I still care. I know what's going on. Everything's all right now. cares about you. He loves us. He knows our needs. He knows where we are. God is intensely interested in everything about us. The Bible reminds us he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He cares for us. Peter said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the fitting of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He cares about us. His eye is over every detail of our life. Hebrews 4 and 13 says, Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We know he's an ever-present help in our lives. He's always with us. If I walk with him, there's never a time he's not there in my life. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Not only is he ever present in our lives, but every one of us can look like look back like David on the past landscape of our lives. And we can see where God has moved again and again. Anybody here, God's ever moved in your life in the past? God ever brought you through battles? God ever brought you through fiery furnaces? God ever helped you march down giants? God ever caused lions to lay down? Amen. When you should have been devoured, when you should have been consumed, when the water should have overflowed you, but yet it was God that arose. It was God that saw you safely through. When I look back on the landscape, of my life, I, I see I, where it's brought me over high mountains, I, brought me through low valleys, I, brought me through lion's dens, I, but I'm standing here I, because of the power I, and the grace I, of God Almighty. Woo! Somebody ought to give him praise and bless his name in this house. You want revival? We're in that kind of atmosphere right here this morning to have a revival.
Amen. Come on, church. You want to have revival. We're in the right place right now in the right kind of atmosphere to have a good old-fashioned move of God. I'm tired of hearing about it, how we need revival. Why don't we just get in this river and let the Lord have his way? Why don't we just get out a little deeper here today and say, Lord, I don't want ankle deep. I don't want knee deep. I don't want loin deep. I want to get in that river that God has said that I can have. God is still our refuge and God is still our strength. Some of you spent more time in this service this morning talking about what you needed from God uh, than what you've given in worship unto God. I said some of you spent more time, uh, amen, telling what you needed God to do uh, than you spent worshiping him. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and worship him now? Uh, why don't you do it by faith? Uh, why don't you trust him? Uh, he's going to move. Uh, why don't you trust him? Uh, he's going to work it out. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and praise him uh, because of who he is uh, and he's worthy of our praise. Ah, my, 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 my. Ah, blessed God. Come on, sit to shout and praise him for it all. We know what we've been through. We know what we've faced. We know how good God's been. We know what he's done. We know what he's going to do. Hallelujah. <laughs> If you're watching online, you ought to lift your hands right there where you are. If you're in your home, if you're in a hospital bed, uh, wherever you are, you ought to raise your hands uh, and you ought to magnify God. Uh, you ought to exalt him. Uh, God can touch you right there uh, in that home. Uh, God can breathe on you uh, right where you are. Uh, God is a mighty God. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Somebody obey the Lord this morning. Somebody obey the Lord in this house today. Ah, God all over this house. Ah, God all over this If you need healing, you ought to get in these waters this morning. If you need a touch in your mind, you ought to get in these waters this morning. You've got things you've been seeking God over. Amen. Only God knows about it. You ought to get in these waters this morning. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Crazy. 